And without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Kramer. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you all for joining. Um, I'm looking forward to this. Uh, I suspect Dr. Remster said the same thing, uh, but unfortunately, our our class schedules are exactly opposite. So she couldn't attend this one and I couldn't attend hers. Um, but uh, getting to actually use our research in a way with people trying to make uh, elections and representation more just and more equitable uh, is definitely the most fulfilling part of the job so far. Um, so I'm really excited to be here and share with you. Uh, and I hope it's informative. And even though we'll be looking at Excel and um, uh, data coding, hopefully a little bit of fun as well. Uh, so uh, as Kate said, um, with questions, if it is pertinent to what's going on in the moment, because I might be going through something too fast, might be talking about numbers in a confusing way or something like that, please interrupt for that type of question. And if it's a little bit broader or uh, conceptual, um, we're gonna hold those to the end just to make sure in case I'm planning to answer it a couple slides later. Um, so let's get started. Uh, all right, so you should be looking at PowerPoint slide um, uh, there, uh, and just a little bit more about me. Again, I'm a sociologist at Villanova University. I study racial inequality broadly, uh, and in particular, then thinking through the borders and boundaries between racial groups uh, in education, in segregation, and then prison gerrymandering came about because Dr. Remster brought up the topic and said, how could we create a counterfactual and look at what a state would look like if it fixed prison gerrymandering? And, and I had the, 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 the GIS um, skills to do it. And so we've created that process here. Um, so what we're gonna do today, what I'm gonna focus on is kind of the beneath the hood, exactly uh, what we do, um, how we get the data, how we clean the data, how we use the data, um, that we're hoping the first wave of states will get posted sometime later this week if everything works out on our end, like, like we're planning. Um, uh, we just want to double and triple check that we're getting everything right and that everything is clear uh, in, in the data that we post to redistricting hub. So we've been a little bit slow and cautious there. Um, So uh, this is what we're gonna do. I'm gonna go through a couple of slides that you may have seen if you were here for uh, last week's On the Nationwide Project, just to catch you up in case someone wasn't here for last week or forgot last week or just wants to hear it again because it's really interesting. Um, uh, and then we're gonna look at how we got the data, what we do with the data once we get it, and then finally how we use it and how we're presenting it to you because uh, if you want to just take our data and run with it in your local state. That's what we're hoping for. Um, but also some other options in case you wanna look at local gerrymandering instead of state level gerrymandering or things like that, how you, how you can use the data for that as well. So that's the plan. Uh, we'll be under the hour, possibly quite quick because I had a little bit more caffeine than I should have this morning. Uh, so I am flying uh, and excited. Dangerous combo for me as a presenter. All right, so. Uh, as Kate mentioned, we had looked at Pennsylvania, ran the uh, counterfactual in which we said, what if there were no prison gerrymandering in Pennsylvania? How different would districts look? Uh, and, and showed that there were a significant number of state house legislative districts that were constitutionally questionable if we took seriously the point that incarcerated individuals should not be considered as residing where they are incarcerated by the state. Uh, and that helped to, along with activists on the ground who had been fighting for fair maps and, uh, and uh, proper racial representation, uh, that helped to convince the Pennsylvania Redistricting Commission to resolve the issue. Um, and so they now get counted as one of the 13 states addressing that in this redistricting cycle. Uh, but because it was the Redistricting Commission itself and not the legislature, we're going to have to make sure that in 2030, they do the same thing and ideally even better job of it. Than in 2020. Um, but the large majority of states don't use, uh, don't resolve prison gerrymandering. They simply take what the census gives them and run with it. Um, and so if they have large prison populations, that may be biasing their, their, uh, their redistricting. Um, along with uh, Dr. Remster, we have a fantastic research team, Denise Wilson, 
uh, Chelsea Canal and Gabby Oliveira um, have been helping uh, make uh, my rough and dirty uh, Excel sheets look coherent and understandable, uh, as well as doing a lot of the labor of cleaning the data, which is probably the number one difficult part of this process, which thankfully our team will have done so that you don't have to remake that. Um, but for example, in 2020, we go to Texas, which is always like ground zero for ridiculous redistricting issues, it seems. Um, so in Texas, 15% uh, roughly of all of their state house districts would be unconstitutional because 12 of them would be legally too small and 11 of them would be legally too large. And the key thing in that is uh, it's largely because where you see aggressive partisan gerrymandering, uh, prison po uh, populations are a very useful population to use as part of partisan gerrymandering. So good governance practices, uh, having a nonpartisan redistricting commission, having clear guidelines about what a fair map is, largely resolve the constitutionality problem of redistricting um, because good governance doesn't create the what Texas created, which was a lot of districts that were right on the edge of unconstitutional. So where you see nonpartisan redistricting, we see less of an impact on constitutionality, but we do see the fundamental problem of miscounting people in their locations, uh, uh, in their prison locations. And again, we use as our guideline um, what the, the US Supreme Court and most state courts have held, which is that you get a 5% deviation window, right? So uh, districts don't have to be exactly the same size. They get to be plus or minus about 5%. Some states have different uh, uh, legal size requirements, but that's the, the, the default go-to, if you will, uh, in most considerations of one person, one vote laws. The key thing here is that this graph looks at the racial difference in how much uh, prison populations affect uh, uh, district size, right? And so if, if you have a negative value on this chart or graph, that means that uh, the average white Texan lives in a district where there are more people incarcerated than there are people who are being moved elsewhere to be incarcerated. So they live, they're more likely to live in effect where there is a prison buoying their voting power rather than black, Hispanic and other Texans who are more likely to be in a district where people are being taken out of and incarcerated somewhere else. And we saw the exact same pattern in Pennsylvania. And when we look at other states that we've been able to finish uh, first drafts of our, uh, of our results, we're seeing this exact pattern play over and over again, which is not surprising given what we know about the racialized reality of incarceration in the United States and criminal justice contact. So how do we get to these graphs? That's what today's uh, um, session is about, kind of give you 20, 30 minutes of under the hood. How do we get to the point where we can confidently say that this is our best, often a very conservative and not conservative in terms of liberal conservative, but conservative in terms of we are underestimating the local impact of prison gerrymandering with some of our estimations. So the first step in any uh, of these processes is of course, getting the data. And the getting the data is both in some parts of it, the easiest part and the hardest part. Um, but again, you shouldn't have to go through this for the sake of looking at 2020 redistricting maps, um, uh, but it is helpful to know that this is the process we went through, especially uh, if you're going to try to to, to, to use our data, people are gonna be asked, well, where did that, those numbers come from? Well, here you go. So the first part of the data is the easiest one. It's getting the census data um, at the census block level, which is actually super easy because the census is used to people wanting their data, right? That is what the census is for. And so they have multiple different websites and ways to get that data. And it was very, very easy. Now, I will complain about the census a little bit later. Um, uh, but in general, at least getting the data that they had is very easy. Uh, the second part of that data is we need to know which district every census block is in. And typically that's come from one of two sources, either state redistricting websites themselves will have an Excel sheet or a comma separated value CSV, or 
at worst, a um, GIS file, a uh, GIS database that we can then download and get the data of every individual block in the state, what district is it in and what Senate district is it in. That's usually pretty easy. A couple states would slow play releasing that as much as possible, um, but eventually that had to be made public. Um, and Dave's redistricting and other redistricting sites have been very good about um, posting those publicly as quickly as they could. The hardest part of prison gerrymandering analyses is getting the data on incarcerated individuals. Um, and it's not necessarily the hard part uh, of how many people are incarcerated, though that alone can sometimes be difficult. The hardest part is getting where should they have been, right? So how many people are incarcerated in a location? That we can find easily. In fact, the census has an estimate of that, though we do not use the census estimate of that in our own analyses. Um, but what we need to know is not just, are you incarcerated, but where should we have you if you weren't incarcerated? Um, and the number one way that we've been successful is just direct contact with someone in the Department of Corrections or Department of Justice or whatever they call it at whatever state they are, um, simply saying, do you have this data? Is it available to get the addresses of people who are incarcerated in state facilities as of April 1st, 2020, which is the day that the census counted um, group quarters, like prisons and jails. Um, often that has been successful and they said, yes, here you go. Sometimes it's been more successful than we imagined and they gave us specific addresses for everybody who was incarcerated in a state prison um, and it was wonderful. So we then had to geocode that, that data. Uh, other times it can be very difficult. Um, so the best practice is when we got those individual addresses and we got the race and ethnicity of people. The second best, uh, which is the most common, is that we do not get a specific address for each incarcerated individual, but rather we would get uh, a total count by home county or committing county. One thing we know is that about 85 to 90 percent uh, of people who are committed to a state facility by a county also reside in that county. So that is uh, a best estimate. Um, uh, that's often publicly available as well from some states. So that wasn't too bad. The worst experiences we've had is we've been asked for hundreds of dollars to pay for the time of a government employee. We've been required to show IRB approval for our research, which is not actually um, required for what we are doing, but one state wanted an IRB approval, which is an institutional review board for those of you who do not work in research. It is a bureaucratic mess. We are exempt from it uh, for this work. And also we've been told that it might take months. Um, so uh, departments of corrections aren't necessarily inclined to do this. They're not used to this type of data request. That's often why direct contact was successful instead of going through a FOIA or Sunshine Law type of act. Though we have done a number of those and that has been successful in some cases. Now to note, because we are looking only at state level corrections, because to ask for every single localities jail populations would be uh, too much work for our small little team. Um, uh, we do not have local jails in our analysis. In most cases, that's not an issue because for most counties, for example, the entire county is in a particular, uh, a particular district. But in counties like my home county of Philadelphia, uh, the state jail had in April around, I think it was 4,000-ish people in it and that's a pretty sizable chunk. And they come from all across Philadelphia, uh, which is split into about 15 or so, 15 to 20 districts. Um, so that was a little bit of error. And ideally local jails would be resolved as well. Similarly, um, the Bureau of Prisons, the Federal Bureau of Prisons, which represents somewhere between 10 and 15% of all incarcerated people in the United States, they simply uh, do not give that data out. It's just not something that, that we've ever been able to get and other people have not been able to get either. Um, and so they are also not uh, in our estimates of returning uh, citizens. 
Um, so this is, as I mentioned earlier, these are the ways in which the analysis that we're going to show you, that we're going to post on the redistricting hub, are conservative. Because in returning only state facilities, in most states, we're returning only about 50 to 60% of people who are incarcerated to a home location. And in most states, we're returning them to their committing county rather than to a specific address. Every state's Freedom of Information Act process is different. Um, I recommend either if you have contacts with journalists or your state ACLU or other uh, good governance um, bodies are great resources for learning how to make a successful FOIA request for your state. Every state is slightly different. Um, if you are interested in doing this process from the ground up, it's important to specify that you want both race and ethnicity data and to ask for home address as well as committing county. Basically, ask for everything you could possibly want and get as much as possible. And you don't get from a FOIA request what you don't ask for. So that's how we got all of our data. And over the last three or four months, it has been trickling in at random uh, dates and times, at random paces, and it has been a bureaucratic uh, headache for me, and I'm barely dealing with it because, again, Denise Wilson has been a rock star in helping us with just keeping our heads above water in terms of all of the data requests and all of the data we've received. So once you get the data, it's time to process and clean the data. So the first problem is state data is not the same as census data. The census is used to, it typically has researchers using it all the time. That is, though not its original intent, that is one of the things the Census Bureau is most used for is social science research. And so they have been very, uh, not user-friendly, researcher-friendly in terms of having kind of a consistent layout of their data. Departments of Corrections are not used to this. This is not what they usually spend their data time on. And so they don't necessarily have that. We've gotten them where they give us zip codes, which do not align well to census block, uh, census block IDs. Um, they've given us block ID codes that are inconsistent with the census's block ID codes, and we've had to backtrack and figure out how to connect those. It is a mess. Every state, though the OMB says for federal data, the Office of Management, um, uh, and I forget what the B is always for, I think budget, um, says, uh, these are the racial and ethnic categories that the United States government recognizes, and this is what all of our data is going to use. Uh, each state does not follow that. So we have had states uh, that have white, black, other. We have had states that have white, black, multiracial, other. We've had states where multiracial double counts people. There are many different ways to count racial uh, categories. Um, and the biggest burden has been problems with uh, Latinx or Hispanic ethnicity. Um, some states simply do not have that data in part because their uh, Latinx population is very small as a proportion. Michigan is our go-to for that example. I think um, they've only recently had a sizable uh, in-migration of, uh, of Latinx uh, people to Michigan. There have always been Latinx people in Michigan, but not a very large percentage of Michigan. And so their state Department of Corrections simply did not keep track of Hispanic ethnicity. Um, they do not have that data. Um, thank you, Kate. Uh, in North Carolina, Latinx people were given a race as well as their, their Latinx status. And in North Carolina, Latinx is a significantly larger population. Um, and so they got double counted. If you were white and Hispanic, you got counted as white and also in Hispanic. Uh, and so we had to figure out either how to, um, to, to identify the, the percent of Hispanics who identified as white or were identified as black or were identified as other um, or drop Hispanic from, from our data set. So some states you will see only white, black, other. Other data sets you'll see white, black, Hispanic, and other. That's based on what the state gave us. Right, so we use the best possible, most detailed racial ethnic data given those state level constraints. As I mentioned, this is only state facilities. Uh, in some states, private facilities do not provide good data to their, to their government partners. 
Again, another reason why private prison industry is a bad, bad approach to this. As I mentioned before, the Federal Bureau of Prisons refuses to give data like this out. Um, and then also local jails often simply lack data. Their uh, incarcerated population is much more, uh, um, are typically there for, for a much shorter period of time. It is harder to keep track of. They are even less well-funded than state departments of corrections. Um, and that can be a big issue uh, for um, local redistricting concerns um, uh, as opposed to state level redistricting concerns. But again, one of the things that I, I like to emphasize and, and legislators uh, and redistricting commissions generally seem to understand and appreciate is if we're seeing the effects we're seeing given this kind of uh, very broad estimation approach, very safe estimation approach that Dr. Remster and I came up with, then the problem is actually worse than we're showing, and it really should get managed and dealt with well. But let's take the, the let's start with the better, the best version, the version where they gave us specific addresses. So the first thing we do, if we're given a specific address for people from, uh, from a prison facility, the first step we do is we remove the exact number of incarcerated people from that prison location uh, from the census. Um, now here's that uh, mini rant I mentioned I was gonna go on with the census. Uh, some of you may know about this. Uh, I'm not gonna go into the, the statistical weeds of this unless we want to in question and answer, but in 2020, out of concerns over data privacy, the Census Bureau incorporated what's known as differential privacy. They basically made the numbers inaccurate so that you could not figure out individual identities. Um, in some of these prison locations, that means that while we know that there were say 150 people in prison in that facility, the census will report that there were 180. Um, those 30 mythical ones are actually somewhere else. Uh, and, and at the state level, it aggregates to be exactly right, but we don't know where those people should be. So we had to leave them there. So in part of that, there are also some state facilities where we knew there were 150 people and the census said there are only 120. So if you look block by block, there are actually some blocks in our data set where there are negative values, but that's okay because it's not the specific block that matters for this, but the aggregation at the district level. But still, I'm very annoyed that they did differential privacy. I think it was a mistake. We can complain about that some other time. If I ever meet you and we have drinks, that will be one of my rants if we ever have drinks together. Um, so having gotten individual addresses, having removed them from the prison uh, facility, uh, we use the census's API um, it's a website that the census created for 2020 um, to identify the block ID of that particular address, right? So they gave me um, uh, 121 Market Street, Philadelphia, zip code 19103. I plugged that into the census API and it gives me the census block ID for that address. <laughs> uh, um, Typically for every state, you get between 50 and 70% match rate. The better the State Department of Corrections uh, um, uh, data collection process, the higher that match rate. Um, uh, after some very basic error cleaning, right? So they forgot a space between the numbers and the word. There's a misspelling like West had two W's in it. Make those basic error corrections. Census API will give you 50 to 70 of those back. If the API can't identify a particular block ID, we use the magic of Google Maps. Quite simply, you look up the address on Google Maps, confirm that there's a building in that ad, on that block that could be that address uh, via the satellite imagery of Google Maps. You right click on Google Maps, you get a geographic coordinates for that exact location. You use those geographic coordinates back into the census API. You can use geographic coordinates instead of uh, uh, street addresses the census API will give you a block ID. So uh, one of the things that our team has been doing has been going through thousands of addresses, finding them on Google Maps, putting in that, uh, that geographic coordinate, getting a corrected address and block ID. So if given aggregate data at the, uh, 
um, at the at the county level generally. Um, remove the exact number of incarcerated from the prison location. Again, still the differential privacy uh, numbers will make that slightly inaccurate. Identify each individual block in a county's share of the county's racial population. So the 100 block of Market Street in Philadelphia, what percent of Philadelphia's black population lives on that block? What percent of Philadelphia's white population? What percent of its Latinx population? What percent of its multiracial other Pacific Islander, native, uh, native or indigenous, et cetera, et cetera? What percent of each group lives on that block from the county of Philadelphia? Return that percentage of the incarcerated people to each block. So if that block has 1% of Philadelphia's Black population, and we know that 200 Black Philadelphians are incarcerated, it's more like 20,000, but we'll go 200 just to keep numbers small, um, then we will return two Black people to that block. And if 100 white people are there and it's 1%, we will return one white person to that block. The larger the population of a county, the more imprecise these estimates are. And so that's a problem for precision because the places that we care the most about are the urban areas that have large populations being sent to rural jails and uh, rural prisons in the same state. Um, but again, this is an underestimate of the impact of prison gerrymandering and it's still finding quite, I think, a significant impact of prison gerrymandering on representation. Um, one thing we know from, from our prior work with Pennsylvania is that if we also include an estimate of education as a proxy for social class, um, it will geographically concentrate the returning, uh, returning citizens more than just using race, um, uh, which is unsurprising, right? But we, we know that incarceration isn't just a problem in a city but it is localized to particular neighborhoods that are hyper-policed um, as opposed to all of the city. But alas, again, uh, uh, don't make the perfect the enemy the good, and we think these estimates are pretty good. So then what do we do? Then, because I am, um, I just realized I closed a thing I shouldn't have closed, uh, because I am not in the 21st century, I still use Stata instead of R. If you're a stats person, please don't kill me. I know I should have learned R. I'm awful. Um, but this is the code. Once I can get it onto the right screen. There we go. Um, I'm not going to walk through this much. If you can read code, it's really, really simple, right? I'm simply generating how many people aren't incarcerated in a location, generating the percent of the county that is represented in a particular location, generating a returning population, adjusting the population, looking at the change, and then right here, and again, I know I'm running through this quickly because Part of the point is you don't have to do this work, we're doing it for you. Uh, right here, we look at the district outcomes. That's pretty much all the code there is. You just have to add in the specific racial categories for a different racial group. As I mentioned, thankfully, you don't have to do that work. Our goal over the next month or so is um, to put clean data onto the redistricting data hubs website. We're gonna show you both individual block level data and the aggregated results. A word of caution with block level data if you, if you want to use them. So if you want to look at, for example, local county or local cities redistricting, um, if you use the CSV and you bring it into Excel, uh, it will change it into scientific notation. And that can be a problem because it will lose some of the precision that you need. Uh, turn it into a string variable, into text if you use Excel. Better is don't use Excel. Um, the best version is one of you uses R, recreates this, and then shares your code so that I am up to date um, statistically. And, and, and my economist friends don't make fun of me for using Stata instead of R anymore. So here's what that data looks like in Excel. This is just a screenshot. You can see this is, this is looking at um, Texas block data. You can see in the highlighted, that is the scientific notation. The key is that this full number 
goes all the way to the end with actual numbers. So if you save the scientific notation by accident, this would become something like 48224000000000. And then there would be hundreds or thousands of them that have the exact same block ID because it oversimplified. Um, so just watch out for that. Sometimes you have to restart your work and that's no fun. Um, the next line is the district for the House, district for the Senate, and then you get into the population according to the census and the adjusted populations according to our analyses. So as you can see, our adjusted populations are not full numbers because at the block level, we know we are estimating, so it's okay for there to be a half a person or 0.14 of a person in that block because our interest is not getting the block to be precisely right, but our estimate of the district. That's the data that you may or may not look at if you're interested in local redistricting. This is the data on an exciting Excel that will be more helpful, hopefully. So I'm going to look at uh, Wisconsin because we've done Texas to death. Though Wisconsin doesn't have nearly as bad uh, a number. Everyone's seeing this Excel sheet that I just pulled up. Anyone want to just acknowledge? Yes, we can see it. Yay. Uh, can you even read the numbers at all? I don't know how big your screens are. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to zoom, zoom in a little bit, make it a little bit better. This is, uh, we'll look at the house districts, which of course, one, brilliant. there we go. These are Wisconsin House districts. You see the district house, B through F are the original census data numbers. So using the unadjusted, unadjusted census, there are 59,834 people in district house one, 55,000 of them are white. Columns G through K are our adjusted analyses. So they're actually, we think, more like 59,969 people who would consider themselves residents of District 1 if we return incarcerated people to their home communities. And these are the adjusted racial numbers. And then columns L through P are the total change. So there are 135 people that we return to District 1. 109 of them are white, 14 black, five Hispanic, eight other. Right. So that's every district. And you can sort these, you can highlight the ones you're interested in highlighting in, do whatever you want with them. That's where you can find what's going on. We also add this impact number, which is to calculate, uh, which, which you don't need to look at Q through T for your own sake, because we do an average at the end. And that's where we got that chart of the average effect. So first, there's uh, Wisconsin's adjusted total population, because again, some of the, the numbers change slightly because of the differential privacy problem. Um, so, uh, so Wisconsin actually added about 1,500-ish people uh, to their population because of differential privacy issues. Uh, so we have the adjusted total population, the target size of a district, looking at what deviation they're allowed legally. So that's the minimum size of a district. Whoop, I scrolled down by accident. The minimum size, ooh, that's not what I want. The minimum size of a district, the maximum legal size of a district, and here's just the Wisconsin uh, racial demographics. It's a 79% white um, state. Uh, so one of the things that we also know is, is states that have larger non-white populations are more likely to have a more significant effect on prison gerrymandering. Um, yes, Aaron, uh, that is because uh, in Wisconsin, um, Asian and Native. Uh, and Pacific Islander, and basically everyone who is not white, black, or Hispanic, um, were such a small population in the jail, in the prisons, that they did not give us that specified out. They just had an other category. And that's really unfortunately common outside of states with either fantastic data collection processes or uniquely large Asian or Pacific Islander populations. So Hawaii, for example, has um, better data on that. Um, some of the states that gave us individual addresses did have native populations, but Wisconsin was not good on that um, because they're a relatively small part of their prison population. Um, uh, 
if someone is interested in that particular, we can, uh, for a particular state, we can check and see what they use. Um, because we have also sometimes merged those categories just to keep our heads wrapped around all of the data. Sometimes they gave us Asian, but it's such a small population um, in their prison that it, that it was better to merge them for data collection issues, reasons. Um, so out of that impact is where we get this average impact by race. And here you see that same story that, uh, that we've told elsewhere, which is that for white uh, Wisconsinites, prison gerrymandering is giving them a slight boost in the power of their representation uh, that is significantly smaller than the harm to black, Hispanic, and other Wisconsinites. Uh, and then there will be rows for specific districts that are legally too small once we do the adjustments or legally too big. Uh, with Wisconsin's Supreme Court giving the best of the bad gerrymanders um, its seal of approval, none were legally too big. Uh, only one, District 53, uh, was legally too small with an unadjusted white population of 86% or so. And so then you can scroll over and take a look at District 53, which I've highlighted here, which looks unadjusted, like a perfectly reasonably sized district. 59,000 is almost right smack in the middle, almost perfect number, except there are over 5,000 people incarcerated in District 53. And so once you take them out, there are only actually 54,000 people in District 53. So those 54,000 people, because they live near a prison, are having their uh, their representation are 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 overrepresented compared to every other Wisconsinite, and one of the keys I think uh, Dr. Ramster pointed out, but I just like to emphasize is uh, most of the I believe it, 99. Let me just make sure that's right. Yes, 90. Most of the 99 districts in Wisconsin are rural and suburban. Yet only one of those rural or suburban districts is benefiting this much by prison gerrymandering. And you can also see other districts like 63, which has a sizable incarcerated population, but 57,800 is not quite enough um, to, get, uh, uh, to get you um, under the 5% threshold. Make sense? And so with each one, we'll also have the Senate along with the House. Senate districts are almost by definition and bicameral larger. So you have a 9,000 person spread instead of the 3,000 person spread um, that was available for the House districts. And because of that, typically we don't see Senate districts that are legally too small or legally too big. However, because those districts are much larger, you see a much larger average impact by race. So instead of it being 30, a benefit of 30 extra or 30 ghost constituents, um, there are 80 something ghost constituents in white populations. And for, for black Wisconsinites, over a thousand people are missing from the average black Wisconsin Senate district, which is pretty sizable um, as well. So that's the data that, that we're, gonna, we're gonna get out. Uh, and, and one of the main things that we want to emphasize um, is, is don't only look at trying to fix 2020 data, though that would be wonderful um, uh, and, uh, to see happen in more states, um, but really now, or maybe in a year once we've dealt with the first round of dealing with the redistricting, but in a year or two, when we get started thinking about 2030, that is the time to start working on this issue. We, our plan is to do every single state that has not fixed this problem. Um, Denise, if you recall, there was like the one that had the $500, I forget what we're doing with them, but we're going to, we're going to try to release every single state. Um, we have been doing them in order of when we got data from them or when we had someone contact us and ask about a specific state. Uh, but now that we've got it's standardized. We're hoping that we'll be able to, to, to push these out quickly over the next month or two. If you have a particular one you're interested in, you can reach out to us and we can send you rough 
uh, rough forms if, if we have them ready, or at least tell you when they'll be ready. Um, so as my high school lacrosse coach told me, early is on time, on time is late. Uh, over the next couple of years is the time to proactively work with the local criminal justice system to create better data so that in 2030, you can be like Maryland and New York and other states that had been thinking about this very early uh, in which this was a plug and play problem for 2020. Maryland had its data cleaned and ready to go and they got 90 something percent through the census batch API and it took like a day because they'd done the work ahead of time. Um, one of the keys we think is also uh, the Department of Corrections has no vested interest in this. Uh, Michigan was, I think, Denise, if you're, if you're around, you can, you can answer that better than I can. They were relatively responsive. Everyone is in the middle of redistricting right now. Michigan was relatively responsive, but they did not have good data. Um, yeah, uh, the states that have fixed this have actually provided white papers that are available about how they fixed it and what works well. Uh, in particular, um, for example, California has done something I think is just phenomenal to convince local communities to do a better job of data collection. California tells the, the counties, if you do not give us home addresses for your local jail, we will spread them out around your county randomly. So it gives them an incentive to be accurate because it's not like they're going to stay where the jail is, no matter what. So why not be accurate instead of inaccurate with that? Um, expect some resistance because asking for, for data collection um, from a Department of Corrections is asking them to do more work. Uh, so there will be some resistance from that. There are some people who also think that incarceration also means you do not deserve the right to representation, which is nowhere in our constitution and a morally bankrupt position in my opinion, but people really believe that. Um, and the other key is um, one of the hurdles that we had to experience was the people who do district mapping are used to only using census data. And census data is cleaned for that use. It is complete, it is not a survey. It is not individual, so it's much less messy. They expect to be able to plug and play with the data. So when, uh, for example, in Pennsylvania, when they heard, oh, we're going to need to correct 30, 40% of addresses, they got, they got scared. Um, yeah, Demos had a really great um, piece. Thank you for that, Kate. Um, uh, they got scared. And it took telling them, no, 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 this, this is okay, this is doable. It is normal to have messy data. This is typical of a process. Um, it helped to convince them to do it. Um, so, so expect that fear as well. Yeah, at Michigan, um, that, that, that does remind me, Denise. Michigan, I think it was, is about five or 6% Latinx as of the 2020 census. Um, and so uh, I, I did a, a weird little estimation on the back of a napkin and it wasn't gonna have a significant effect because they are a small population um, share in Michigan. But again, it should be fixed even if it's a small population. Um, I just do understand why they didn't have it. Um, so again, if you have follow-up questions, if you've got a particular sticky data question, if, um, it all made sense to you when I was walking through Excel, but then you're actually doing it yourself and, and it's confusing. Please reach out as, as, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm getting to share this work with people who are actually trying to do something about um, our system it is the best part of doing research. I never really actually thought it would happen. It's been wonderful to, to be involved at all. So we really are happy to help um, however we can. Uh, and thank you all for listening to me babble on about uh, data for quite a while. I'm gonna stop sharing. Uh, Texas was surprisingly responsive. Um, you might be uh, uh, in part because they have such a large Department of Corrections that they needed to be bureaucratically competent about things, that a state with a very small Department of Corrections often just doesn't have people who do that. So Texas had the infrastructure for it, gave us numbers really quickly. Um, the only, the, the problem with Texas was getting the redistricting data from them because you know, uh, it, it, the specifics of Texas was basically, they came out with a map that they were gonna propose and then two days later they voted on. And then a day later they adjusted it because they had a couple that were on the wrong side of the 5% uh, 
And so you had to change it kind of on the fly. And basically there was no window between them proposing a map and then and them taking uh, and them uh, 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 um, ratifying that map. But the Texas Board of uh, the Texas uh, Department of Corrections or Department of Justice was very responsive. They did have some private prisons um, that were problems, and they do have a decent number of federal prisons that it would have been nice to have as well. And I can only imagine that uh, local facilities like Houston's jail or Dallas's jail um, will are also skewing things. Uh, Texas did not give us street addresses. They gave us committing. They gave us home county, um, which as much as I would have liked street addresses, that would have stopped our work entirely because there are something like a hundred and something thousand people in <laughs> incarcerated at the state level in Texas, just the state level. Um, and so that um, even if we got 70%, that still would have been, you know, 30, 40, 50,000 to hand code, which would have been a lot. So these are great questions. Keep them coming. We still have some time. Um, uh, Dr. Kramer, I want to pass along a question from um, somebody who messaged me. Um, and I, I, I think the answer is no. She was asking about um, folks who are detained by ICE. Um, so, yeah, I'm assuming since they're federal, that's also. Yeah, that's also a no. They're not even through the Department of uh, uh, the Borough. They're not even through the Bureau of Prisons necessarily because it is through ICE. And so many of those are also private facilities, which are even less uh, good at reporting. But that is a real concern um, and, and not just a concern for uh, border states where we think of it. Um, uh, just to go back to Pennsylvania, because that's the one that we've looked in the most depth at, uh, York County Jail, um, they, they replaced the old jail with the new jail and the old jail became an ICE detention center. So that was another hundreds of Latinx people who are getting counted as, as residing in York, but we know that they do not reside in York. And many of them will not look into it. Uh, into paid geocoding services. Um, uh, we have not. Um, we are, uh, sweat equity is the way to go in academia. Um, we don't have a grant to pay for this um, like that. Uh, and, and one of the things that we've heard is that what traditional um, GIS consulting and mapping organizations were quoting states at was ridiculous. So um, we put in a bid, uh, Wyoming is a state that decided it wanted to solve this problem. Uh, but they don't have that big a budget for redistricting because they're a small state. Um, uh, and they were quoted by their map providers of $40,000 to fix prison gerrymandering for, I think it, they have like something like two, somewhere between two and 4,000 people who are incarcerated. Um, so if we were to do it by hand coding and we were to charge a reasonable hourly rate, we were able to justify $9,000 of a budget. I don't know where the other $31,000 was going other than into somebody's pocket. Um, so most of those uh, that we've seen are charging an arm and a leg for work that is not super fun, but not technically intensive at all. Um, you know, we, we've got we've got student work study undergrads doing it, and it's boring for them because it's so easy. Um, yeah. Yeah. Great questions here. Um, Dr. Kramer, I actually have one myself uh, that I was wondering about. So in theory, well, in actuality, Census Day is April 1st, 2020, but in reality, you know, they're collecting that data over a long mm -hmm. period of time. Is that uh, information uh, in terms of the, the date uh, when you received the uh, information from the prisons? Um, are, are they transparent about that and sort of like what snapshot in time you're looking at? And yeah, it, so the census, that an issue for you. yeah, the the census basically demands April first is the day from the prisons, right? So they they did give their April first counts. That's what the census got from every state, um, unless there's one that violated that. But but to to my knowledge, every state knew April first is the day we give you our prison counts. So we're going to get our prison counts for April first. Um, one of the things that we've done with our with our request has always been we want your April first data. We want the same numbers that you gave the census. We don't want to miss a line. 
which again, matters less in 2020 because of the differential pri privacy, honestly, debacle around social statistics. But um, we said we want April 1st, and if they gave us April 1st, that's what we ran with. Uh, and if they said we don't have April 1st, but we have this date, um, that's a best a best guess. And we're, we are keeping track of all of those you know, this is the best guess that we have. This is what we had to do about race and ethnicity for each state. Um, and we'll have that kind of as a readme along with the data, just kind of what each state gave us. So like, for example, the, the question about Asian identity and we'll be able to say, well, like they gave us white, black, other. That's what they gave us. So that's what we used. Or they gave us white, black, Asian, other, but the Asian data was unreliable because it didn't add up to, to 100%. So here's what we did, if that's the case. Uh, California. So California is one of the states that, that has solved prison gerrymandering. Solved. <laughs> um, California is one of the states that has has uh, that that fixed this problem for 2020, if you will. Um, and so we we have them on a back burner. Um, we were prioritizing the 37 states that did not do this, um, and then trying to think about how we could could do a counterfactual of, and here's what would happen if they were counted where they were incarcerated just to demonstrate kind of the, the equity effect. Um, so honestly, I do not have a good answer for you. I would hope that we would get to it over the summer, but I cannot promise that. If you have a particular question, oh, we, we still don't have the data. God, Denise, thank you. <laughs> I'm so glad you were here. Um, uh, we actually might be able to do California without getting anything from California. So anyway, the earliest we're going to get to that is the summer. That is my hope. If you want to, if you have a specific question about California, I might be able to answer it before we do the official release type of project. Um, and please feel free to reach out to me um, about that. I might be able to answer that, but yeah. Oh, it's like my classroom. Oh, there we go. Um, I think, I, I, uh, Sailor, that's a great question. Um, I think from one, one caveat I will say is that uh, local activists will always know what plays better in their state than I will. Um, so for example, uh, in some states, in Arizona, legislators were pissed that other legislators had less work to do. And it was like the legislator on legislator violence, <laughs> if you will, um, which is valid, which is absolutely valid. So one of the things that, that uh, that, that we, we've told some, some people to think about is, you know, just look at which legislators have someone who has communicating with incarcerated people or contact liaison with criminal justice as something one of their staffers does. And notice that it is the people where people are, get, are, are getting incarcerated from, not the people who have a prison in their district as one of the proofs of the putting of the equity. Um, for, uh, for some kind, for like Wyoming and other more libertarian states, it was a, a, a fairness issue in terms of just um, equal representation. For Pennsylvania, it was the, the racial bias in the outcome. So it is kind of getting to know your particular legislators or redistricting commissions and like what, what are the buttons that will work for them. Um, but generally it has been the uh, the other thing that often works is it, it has no effect on funding if you fix your redistricting, because that often will create a defensiveness around funding issues. Funding is separate from how you redistrict. That'll go back to the original census data. That's a much different formula. Um, the other um, thing that, that has been effective has just been the, the point about um, while the average experience for white is getting overrepresented, it's really just four or five or six districts in a state that are winning this lottery of having a prison and thus being overrepresented. But the overwhelming majority of districts are not, right? And so one of the things that was really powerful, powerful in Pennsylvania was that, um, you know, it was not just people from Philadelphia complaining about representation, because in Pennsylvania politics, people from Philadelphia complaining about the state is normal. But it was also people from rural parts of the state saying, wait a second, 
my rural part of the state is not being represented like that other rural part of the state because in the 90s you built a prison there. That doesn't make sense. So that was a type of coalition that they don't normally see. And I think that was powerful as well. These are all fantastic questions. I do see we are at time. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording. Um, I don't know Dr. Kramer's time, if he's able to stay on, if there are any questions you'd like to ask um, off the record, uh, but we also have the help desk. And so if you think of something later, um, you can send it to me and I'll uh, be sure to get in touch with uh, Dr. Kramer. So just wanna say, Thank you again so much for, for coming and, and explaining this to us. Um, I think as you can tell, people are really eager to, to see how they can affect change in their state. So thank you. Thank you all for the work you're doing.